Hi guys, welcome back to uh, my channel. Um, after a, a short hiatus uh, where I was with busy with uh, creating contents for the classroom sessions for the new AQ 2022. Now I finally managed to get a little bit of time to sit down and set up the first uh, uploaded video of the new AQ 2022 uh, discussing um, sample assessments from AAT qualifications um, for various um, hyper qualification like your level two um, certificate in accounting or level three diploma in accounting. Possibly, be, possibly I might do something with level four this year as well. Hopefully, um, trying to keep that into a streamlined process, but we will try to concentrate on um, the new exciting uh, AQ 2022 uh, uh, assessment qualifications. Uh, at the moment, um, there are so many uh, new thing getting implemented. Therefore, uh, students might not have the the opportunity to see the exams or any of the the related screen uh, the screens, um, uh, you know, exclusively at the moment. You may still do the AQ 2020, uh, 2016 format, but AQ 2022 is an updated version of that one. There are certain uh, elements being removed and certain elements being added for the qualifications, and of course, um, you know the the end result is going to be still you'll be get, getting a uh, an approved professional qualification from uh, Association of Accounting Technician, which is the AAT. So, for without further ado, uh, the first video of the series, which is going to be for uh, the introduction um to the bookkeeping module which is part of your level two qualification which i'm going to bring it up for you the exams now has changed to a different format it's been done under something called um you know a, a standalone um exam uh secure window or something like that but before we used to use the flash player uh secure pass and then now the surpass we were then now they have gone into the new one, which is the PSI bridge. Uh, the exam process itself now has changed. Uh, in the past, uh, your exam center normally used to set it up for you, put the code and everything for you. You just start to go there and log in and then start working with it. Now, the exams now will set the exam up for you, but you have the onus. You have to turn up to the exam center and you have to log into your own account, which is only you know the password of into the system. And then you once you arrive at there, the examiner will probably see you are available to do the test and then they will get the clearance for you so you can work from the computer you're logged into. And it's not much change in the way of the, the type of assessment is going to be because this assessment Time is one hour, 30 minutes. Previously, it was almost same as well. I'm, as well as I know, it's also one hour, 30 minutes. But you had 10 questions. Now you have 11. But uh, the total marks are going to be remaining at 100. And uh, if you can see this screen here, you probably see there are some options like changing the contrast. And obviously, there are shortcuts in your keyboard, which you may be able to come across. Uh, you probably down here. How are you going to? Um, switch around certain aspects of it. And then obviously you have a number of questions you have here. The total hours are one hour, 30 minutes. I'm not going to take all of that time, but we will discuss those questions as we go along. We will try to keep it short and sweet. As usual, my videos is not going to take the whole length of the exam because normally that's not the purpose of it. And then obviously here there are index pages. You can basically switch between questions. And once you started your assessment, uh, but you haven't started yet, so you can't move on there. And there's a highlighter which allows you to highlight uh, part of the, the question like this way here goes. So that means you can um, go back to that and then clear whatever you have highlighted in case you have some um, you know concerns about it. And then obviously some references means this is the, the start of that one and the references you can pull up at any time you're going to be uh, doing your assessment. Tip of my coffee there and then I'm going to press continue here and I'll start with the exam. The timer is start running down now. And then here you have seen page two of 12. So obviously the page one was the reference page. So you got further 11 pages of 11 questions there and every task will come with the, the particular information you got there, like the task one. Uh, you don't need to use the highlighter. You can just carry on. You can move around anyway. So if I just select it, it won't work now. If I use the highlighter, I will be able to select it. So here, see that question here. You 
can move to the next question without any issues. Like if you go here, all the questions can be go backward and forward. OK, and then also when you're answering it, you click on the answer until you um, you cannot click on it until you type the answer in there. So please remember once you finish the page, Click on the answer. That means it confirms you have completed all the answers of that one. So it's very important you follow that. So let's look at the first question here for me. This task is about manual and digital bookkeeping. Remember in the new qualification AQ 2022, the computerized accounting software is being phased out. You don't have that anymore. Therefore, most of the questions you get in the bookkeeping modules will incorporate your knowledge of your computerized accounting systems. Uh, that is now being shown on level one. It doesn't get taught separately anymore, like you was to be on AQ 2016. So you need to be familiarizing yourself with some accounting software. Please refer to my previous video on AQ 2016 about uh, Sage software. You may be able to find some more informative videos in uh, the YouTube as well, and uh, they will give you some sort of a, uh, a glance into the world of digital bookkeeping systems. Uh, there may be some exposure given to you during your studies, but at the moment, um, uh, we, we part of our um, a curriculum, we added a day of computerized accounting software. I'm not sure not every learning provider will be doing so. So just keep an eye out for that one. It's just for your knowledge anyway. And then if you look at that here, identify which documents or reports would be used for each of these purposes as below. So they're giving you here with the drop down menu with four different answers there. So to summarize your income and expense and report the performance in an accounting period, the only option I can think about it, it's not going to be anything else but this profit and loss statement because your income and expense will result in a profit or a loss. If your income is higher than profit, uh, expense, then you incur a profit. And if your expense is higher, you incur a loss there. So this is your profit and loss statement. And to check the amount of debit entries into the bookkeeping system equal to the total amount of credit entries, where it is then, you're going to transfer the balances of your T accounts into a particular uh, check balance, um, you know, uh, like a system. What is that? It is. It is for your trial balance. Your trial balance is going to be giving you an idea whether your debits and credits are matching and your entries are all correct. But not doesn't mean your double entries are still correct. But at the moment, for time being, it will give you a correct balance on both sides. To summarize assets and liabilities and capitals at a given date. So obviously, you know your profit and loss statement will give you an income and expense scenario, but if you're going to do your assets and liabilities and capital, you have to use your statement of financial position. It gives you what is the snapshot of your current assets and liabilities against your capital. Okay, and then the last one, obviously you think, oh, the missing answer will be that one, but it's fine. Uh, remind, uh, to remind the customers of amounts outstanding and, and to request payment, we will send them a statement of account. A statement of account will show all their balances, all the new transactions, all the credit notes, any previous settlements, discounts, everything will be added in there and there will be a statement of account. So that will be four marks for that one. So let's move on to the next question. It says here, the product code is range of clothes Follow the format below. The first two letters of the product color, the first two letters of the product type, and a sequential number for each product. So if you look at that here, 106. So the next sequential number is going to be 107. And the one after is going to be 108. So that's how it's going to go. All right. So here, the brown shirts, it has to be started with double click on there, BR for the brown. SH for the shirt and the number is 107. That should be your code here and double click on this one. RE for the red, WA for the waistcoat, 108 for the next one. See, they are all sequential numbers and the first two letters of your first word, second um, two letters of your second word, uh, the first two letters of the second word, and that should give you these product codes. That will be two marks for that one. And then let's look at the next one. Indicate now identify whether each of the following statements regarding the manual bookkeeping systems are true or false. They're talking about manual bookkeeping system. A petty cash book is always a book of prime entry, but never a part of a double entry book system, bookkeeping system. 
which is fundamentally wrong because the word they use always automatically. Let me highlight it quickly. The word always here, it is an absolute answer. If it's going to be always a book of prime entry, not part of double entry bookkeeping system, it is false because your petty cash book can be a book of prime entry and also be part of a double entry book, same as your cash book. OK, uh, we will think about how that's going to be working on later questions if you get there. But normally, if you have an analysis column, what you do, you part of your double entry, like uh, your credit entries in your cash book or the petty cash book is incorporated in your book of prime entry and the debit entries will in fact will go into the relevant key accounts as the, the second entries there. Therefore, it can be a part of the double entry system. The next one is cash book is not part of the double entry bookkeeping system if there is a bank account in the general ledger. OK, so if you look at that here, what you need to do, a cash book is not part of the double entry bookkeeping system if there is a bank account in the ledger. Yes, it's true, because if you look at that, the bank account itself normally will classed as part of the double entry and book of prime entry if you use just the cash book itself and then do the analysis columns into different accounts. But in this scenario, we haven't got it that way because it says here it has a separate bank account in the ledger account, so that is absolutely fine. So it is not part of the double entry bookkeeping. OK, so the statement is true. It didn't say will be the part it says it's not a part, therefore it should be fine. Complete the following statement about digital bookkeeping systems by selecting the appropriate option in each gap below. So if you look at that here, digital bookkeeping systems will reduce errors or prevent an incorrect amount being entered. OK, so there is an option for you, reduce error or pre uh, prevent the incorrect amount being entered. And then, but it will not prevent the duplication of errors automatically balance account. So there is two options. What do you think it is? So if you look at that, common sense says it is going to be reducing errors, not the other way around. Prevent the incorrect amount being entered. So when you're entering an invoice, if you put 100 pounds instead of 1000 pounds, that is an error you're going to make. The computer will still accept that as a valid number. So it will not prevent an incorrect being uh, amount being entered, but it can reduce errors. But it will not prevent the duplication error. What if if you do the invoices twice? It's not going to stop it, is it? Because obviously computer software will allow you to enter as many duplicate numbers there unless you don't do it. So therefore it will not prevent the duplication of error, but it will automatically balance your accounts, so whatever amounts you put there, it will automatically balance an account for you with relevant entries. So you have completed this task. As I said to you, you cannot move on to other questions unless you press the answer button here. So once I press the answer button, it moves on to question number two. But here, if you noticed, I can move around now because I haven't answered everything else. And task one is locked because you answered it. It has given you this has been answered. Select the edit button to enable you to edit the answers. I'm not going to edit anything here, but we will leave that for later on to make any edits. OK, so here I'm going to move on to question number two and then see we work from there. So here the task is about principles of double entry bookkeeping. This task contains part A to C. The following accounts are in the bookkeeping systems, identify the classification of each account. Plant and machinery, of course, you know, this is a non uh, current asset, which is going to be a long term asset for you, which you use for the benefit of the business to generate profit. OK, so that is an asset. Wages and salaries, it's for that period only, and therefore this will class as an expense. A loan from the bank, it's something you take from the bank, so you have to give it back, and therefore it becomes a liability. A commission received, on the other hand, it is a sort of an income for the business because it will generate revenue. And then if you look at the this information here, assets accounts totaling at 159,772, the capital account shows a balance of 100,652 pounds. Your accounting equation is going to be normally asset 
minus liabilities is equal to capital. To find the missing liability account, all you have to do, swap the capital with your liabilities. So your minus liability will be become a plus liability if you put it on the other side of the equation. And this capital will become a negative amount on this side of the that side of the equation. So the this minus that, it should give you an amount of, let me just my calculator. Hundred and fifty nine thousand seven hundred and seventy two minus hundred thousand six hundred and fifty two. It gives me fifty nine thousand. Hundred and twenty. If you add these two also, you will get the value of your cap, uh, your assets. So your equation still will match. So here they're asking you about. Uh, following transactions below have uh, been entered into the bookkeeping systems. Identify the dual effect of each transactions by dragging the appropriate description into the table below. You should ignore VAT. So here, when you're buying purchase, uh, purchasing a motor vehicle on credit, what is your motor vehicle is going to be? Is that your normal purchase purchase, something you're buying to sell? Now, this motor vehicle expected to be used by the business for a foreseeable future. Therefore, you are acquiring an asset. So that means your assets are going up in value. But I haven't paid for it by cash or bank. This has been bought on credit. Therefore, it doesn't have no effect on your bank account, but it will have an effect on your liability because you have to owe this money to the person who you're buying the vehicle from. Therefore, liability for this uh, motor vehicle is going to be increasing. Might be as a purchases uh, or a payables ledger or my buy a loan whichever it is you're going to buy on credit that means your liability is going to go up there so it's going to be saying increase both in assets and a liability okay so this is both is going to increase asset your liability the next one is going to be repaid a loan in cash so therefore loan is a liability when you're paying some of your loan what happens to that loan? It decreases, so your liability is decreasing, but also your cash, you paid with your cash. Therefore, your cash was in a higher position. Now it also has come down. So what's going to be happening here? Your liability, also your asset, both are reducing. So here, uh, decrease in both an, um, an asset and a liability there. Sold a surplus office equipment, for cash. So what happened here? You have equipment accounts. You have a certain value there. Some of them are surplus to your requirement. You may ask, what is the surplus? That means it is extra. I don't need that anymore. I'm not going to be using it. I'll sell that off. So I'll have this table here. I'll sell that table because I don't use it. I make generate some cash. So this is the example it is. When I'm going to sell it for cash, what happens? My asset side from my office equipment is decreasing, but another asset which is cash account is increasing. Therefore, it is going to be both increase and a decrease of an asset there. Equipments are going down, cash is coming up. Both are assets. Received a bank deposit from the owner. So what do you mean by that way? When you're receiving a bank deposit from the owner, that means owner has put more money into the business. It is increasing his capital because we owe that money back to the owner therefore, isn't it? And what is also happening to my bank account? Bank account value also increasing it. So capital and your assets as your bank deposit account, both are increasing. So let's put that here. And then the last one, paid a credit supplier using a bank overdraft. Oh, there now we have to think very carefully because what we have done now, we have, a liability, it's been settled by another liability. If you know, look at it here, credit supplier, it is a liability. Bank overdraft, it's a liability. If it's an asset, it will reduce. But because the bank is already overdrawn, which is a liability, which is going to increase the liability now. Imagine I had 10,000 pounds in my bank uh, overdraft and I have supplier for 1,000 pounds. I pay the supplier of 1,000 pounds. What happened to my supplier account? It becomes zero. But what happens to my bank overdraft? It is going to be increased by another 1,000 pounds because I'm borrowing another 1,000 from the bank 
to pay for my supplier. So therefore, it is going to be decreasing both a liability. So if you look at that here, both increase and decreasing in a liability here. Because one of the liability is my supplier, it is coming down, but my overdraft is going up. OK, so we have done that one and we can move on to the next question. Answer and next. So here, task three, we're looking at this task is about processing customer invoices and credit note and entering in day books. So again, you have to go back to thinking, oh, how this is work in the process. When you look at it here, they're talking about bulk discount. This bulk discount gets calculated before you calculate the VAT. Normally, the trade discounts, bulk discounts are instantaneous discounts happens before you even we charge the VAT. Contrast to you, from payment discount. From payment discount is optional. It is given to the customer whether they want to pay early. If they pay early, they can enjoy the benefit of a small discount of a prompt payment discount. Process is slightly different because it is an optional one. This one will be automatically charged before we get to the total amount. And the prompt payment discount get calculated when they're paying for it. OK, so therefore you have to be distinguishing between these two. So here the first one is 2500 units of G996 price before discounts one pound 15 per unit plus VAT. So therefore the amount for it going to be in this scenario. Get the calculator out again. So I have 2500 multiplied by one pound 15 pence. So that gives me a value of 2875. Since there is no decimals here, I'm going to leave the decimal bits as it is. But when it comes to discounts, I may have to use the, the decimals. The trade about discount is for 3%. So we're going to find out what is the 3% of it. So I'm going to multiply by 3% in my calculator and gives me an 86 pounds and 25 pence off from payment discount, uh, sorry, uh, bulk discount. So what is left of it? So if I'm going to take this away from 2,500, uh, sorry, hold on, 2875 multiply by 1.15 equal to, no, hold on. Got it wrong, give me one second, 2875. Multiply by 0 0.03. Yeah, that's fine. And then the amount left over, it's going to be the amount after discount 28, sorry, 2788.75. And then now we'll be able to charge the 20% VAT to it. So multiply by 20% of VAT, that gives me 500 and 57 pounds dot 75 pence and the total amount now is going to be altogether 330 sorry 3346 pounds and 50 pence 3346 dot 50 3346 dot zero yeah i got that answer now so they're asking you now where i'm going to be recording this so here if you look at that this is about processing customer invoices this is a purchase invoice for you but this one it will be going in my sales um day book because from my perspective it is a sales invoice i'm sending to my customer so this customer invoice will be recorded and therefore is on my sales day book. And the total amount is going to be 3346.50. And the VAT is 557.75. The net amount is going to be 2788.75. And then obviously you have uh, and uh, the analysis column for your 
um, invoice. Let me check what product it is. The product number is G996. So whatever the net amount you have here, and you put it here, 2788.75. If there are multiple items with different codes there, I will be able to split that net into these three figures. But since there's only one item, your net will be equal to this amount from the um, the itemized section there. So there is no further part here. So let's move on to question number four. So here, this task is about processing receipt from customers. Therefore, now we had to involve cash book a little bit. So they're saying here, BCK Limited has received a check for £1,434.16 from print PLC in full settlement of two invoices and the credit note below. So if you look at that here, this is an invoice, this is an invoice, and this is a credit note. So what we need to do now, we had to find out whether this is fine, the amount and the, uh, the invoices and credit notes are reconciling. So let's find out how much is the actual amount they owe. £609.84 plus 864 pounds minus 130 pounds.68. So it gives me a new total of 1,343 pounds and 16. So if you look at that here, the amount, it is not the right amount because here the amount, it's going to be 1,343.16. And the number here, it's been 434 instead of 343. Therefore, there is a discrepancy of. Give me a second, please. Equal to minus 1434.16. So 91 pounds is been overpaid. So you have received a check more than what they owe you. So they're asking you here, please complete this um, information, the uh, following statement about the accuracy of the amount received by the, selecting the appropriate option here. Print PLC has overpaid the amount owing. So here, if you look at that, when you're sending that, um, uh, BKC received a check more than uh, what they owed. Therefore, the print PLC has overpaid the amount. So what you should do, normally BCK Limited, offer them a refund of £91 for the overpaid amount. Sometimes you might also get away by sending a credit note for them so they can buy some goods for you free of charge. You may put it that way. The credit note will be used that way. Okay. So here, this is the right scenario because they overpaid. You should normally offer a refund. Then look at the next one here. Chase PLC has offered a customer a 2% discount for payment for all of the outstanding invoices detailed below by um, end of the week. Calculate the amount that should be paid by the end of the week to settle each invoice, the total of and the all invoices as well. So if I'm going to pay them, I need to find out what is the amount for it? Because if I take advantage of the prompt payment discount, and then obviously, what is the total value of the all the invoices? So if I'm going to look at it, the first one is 1,590. Multiply by 98%, which is the amount less after the 2% is calculated. The first invoice will come to a total of 1558.20. The next invoice is going to give me 354. Multiply by 98%. It's going to give me 34692. <coughs> And the next answer is going to be 564 pounds multiplied by 98 percent. It's going to give me 552 pounds and 72 pence. So add all of those figures together. And it should give me my total value I have to pay. Uh, add 1558.20. And that gives me £2,457.80. 
84 pence. So that should be your answer for the total of your invoice. So you get four marks for that as well. So here they're asking you, I love this question. OK, so Beta Limited has received a check for 1610 pounds and the remittance advice below from the customer. So this is the remittance advice advocating they're going to be paying all of these invoice numbers. Customers term for payment are net monthly. If I say net monthly, that means it's not 30 days. Please remember the difference with net monthly is if you incur a bill in this month, you pay the bill by end of next month. That is what the meaning of net monthly. If I say 30 days means if I buy something on 20th, you have to buy by 30 days of that invoice day. When it comes to net monthly, it gives you until end of that following month to settle that discount. Uh, the not discount the, the invoice. So here, the company policy is to allocate any underpayments as a part payment and to query any overpayment. That means we need to find out if they pay less, you just going to look at the last part as a part payment. And if you have overpayment, you had to query that information. So here they're saying the balance board forward was 74760. Okay, so if you look at that here, if you add these two, these two invoices, these were the old balance board forward. So therefore, I can allocate the full payment for it. See, at both of these, it's going to give you 447 pounds and 60 pence. I can allocate whole of that payment. Okay. The next one is there's a delivery note 1322, which should be equal to the invoice number 147440. Uh, so 47740 we have here. So there is a higher value on my invoice. OK, so what we need to do in this scenario, we have to be very prudent. According to this, we can allocate any underpayment as a part payment and query any overpayment. So what we need to do here, we have to query an overpayment. Oh, so sorry, it's going to be uh, allocated part payment for this one because the remittance advice, it is giving you only a part payment. The next one on scenario, if you look at that here. This invoice. 838 pounds dot 80. What is that going to do? Because this one resulted in an overpayment of next one. If you look at these two. That should equal to each other. OK, so therefore, if you take this away, 150 pounds from this invoice, that should give you 688 pounds 80. So for me, realistically, I have to make a part payment, but Let's check what it says there. Give me one second, please. Let me confirm that quickly. Yeah, for me, this is absolutely fine because we're going to allocate the full payment for this. And then also this credit note because it will give you equal amount of for this invoice. If I go and reconcile both these two, that will give you a full payment of it. Therefore, it should be fine. But the only question I have here, there is 474.40 on my invoice on the remittance advice, but the account itself has a different amount, 477 pounds, 40 pence. Therefore, I can only allocate a part payment of it. I can't say it's an overpayment, because it is not what paid. They paid a lesser amount for you here. The amount was paid to you 474.40, but here we expected 477.40. So therefore there will be a three pounds underpayment here, which we will reconcile when we contact the customer. Next time we will tell them, okay, this is an underpayment. We have to pay a little bit more there, okay? And that's all it is there to this question. Task number five, we've done four questions. We still have further seven, including uh, this one. Uh, hopefully we'll have enough time for that one. It should be fine as well as now because two questions I noticed is very quick to do. Uh, this task is about processing supplier invoices and credit notes entering in the day books. This contains part A and B. So if you look at that here, Bifra Limited, there is an invoice there. It's net monthly and they're asking you enter the invoices in digital bookkeeping system by selecting which module it is going to be. So this one we talked about, this is going to be an invoice. 
and this is going to be a supplier invoice which goes into my purchase daybook. So we're going to do a supplier code here from the list. Supplier code here, BIF32. Make sure you use the right uh, case as well. The ledger account code is going to be 5032. So this is the ledger amount code, 5032. The invoice number, it should be here as well. Invoice number is 3239. We have that information. And they're asking you, what is the net amount? So the net amount is according to this, 371.25. So 371.25. Please remember, just do what they ask you to do. Don't worry about others. Why you ask why the rest of them are not there? Because on the digital bookkeeping, if you put the net, it will automatically calculate the VAT and the total, and it gives you the amount there. Because that's what we're going to use, the right VAT code of VAT number four, which is 20%. Because if you notice that here, VAT charged is at 20%. We had to choose the, the right code code for this. If you, if you choose a different code or if you left it empty, you will not be charged that or will be charged the incorrect one. Um, you will not have the right information entered in the system. So we have to choose the right VAT code of VAT for 20%. Now looking further down, the purchase order and invoices below relate to goods supplied by Gower products. Please supply 80 boxes of cable fittings, ZX154, agreed price is 476 per box, agreed terms, net 30 days. So it's definitely 30 days. Okay, so you have to be a bit careful when you have to compare this. Okay, this one, we have to find some discrepancies here. Identify four discrepancies in the invoices. So here, when you look at it now, 23rd of May and the invoice is charged on 20th of May, it's impossible to raise an invoice before even the order was placed. Therefore, straight away now, the date of invoice is incorrect because that gives you lesser time to settle your uh, invoice because obviously they've given you 23rd May is the one you inquiring about it. How the date of invoice can be even before that? It has to be somewhere after. And also now let's look at the, the item. The item requested was that X154, but the item supplied was XZ154. Therefore, the, the product supplied also is going to be incorrect. If you look at that number of items, it's fine, but the product itself, it's incorrect. So if I'm going to highlight it, I'm going to highlight this and that just to show you the other discrepancies we have found so far and then also if you notice that here the amount is going to be 400 pounds 76 per box and it's also 476 per box let's calculate it see whether that amount has been calculated properly so 80 multiplied by 4 pound 76 pence will give me 480.80 net amount is also fine there but let's find out what is the VAT to it. So 20% VAT is £76.16. That is also fine. And then let's find the total. Total is going to be £456.96. So if you look at that here, if you add these two, it should give you 96, but you have 76 here. That number is invalid. So your total also not correct there. But there is one more. If you remember when I told you about the net terms, look at that, 30 days terms and net monthly are whole two different things. If you say 30 days from the date you have actually sent the invoice, say this invoice was issued on 25th May, it needs to be settled by 19th of June, 30 days. When you say net monthly, it allows them until the 30th of June, which is the end of next month there. So therefore, this agreed terms, it's not actually reflecting on the invoice there. So that will be the, the last one. So these four information are incorrect. Everything else, it is absolutely fine. So let's answer this and move on to task number six. This task is about processing payments to suppliers. This task contains part A to C. Okay, so let's have a look at it here. An invoice dated 15th of May has been received by a supplier for 9,750, including VAT. Supplier terms are uh, of payments are 30 days net or 1% discount 
if you pay within 20 days of invoice, 2% discount if the payment received within 10 days of invoice. Identify the date which the supplier should receive the payment if no discounts were taken. So if it's going to be 15th of May, 30 days net allows them until 14th of June. Obviously, may have 31 days. So remember, it will be one lesser day on the next month there. OK, so this is going to be 24th of June. So 14th of June will be the uh, the deadline to make a payment. You should receive a payment by then. They're asking you identify the amount to be paid and the date by which the supplier should receive payment for each terms of the payment offered uh, uh, below. So if you look at that 20 percent, now we have to find the date first. So let me clear the highlighter. The date should be in that scenario. If you look at that here, if the, the invoice was given to you on 15th of May, it gives you up to 25th of May. And the, oh, sorry, not, if it's 20 days, it's going to be 4th of June. 4th of June. And if it's 10 days, it's going to be 25th of May. And the amount, because it will be only 1% prompt payment discount here. So we have to take away how much is it? So we'll take one person away, which is 99% of 9570 multiplied by 99%. It's going to give me 9652.50. And the, the next one, you get 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. And that scenario, 9750 multiplied by 98%, it's going to give me nine thousand five hundred and fifty five pounds. OK, so that is the amount for that one. Let's do decimal here just in case because we have a decimal above there. We just keep to the same standard. OK, it, you're not going to lose marks if you don't put the decimal in there because look at that. The amount is absolutely fine. They didn't specifically say you have to do a decimal there, but for this one you must absolutely put two decimal places. All right, now let's look at the next one. Here they are asking you a statement of account received from another supplier central products does not reconcile with the supplier report below. The statement of account shows an outstanding balance of 8782. OK, statement of account. This amount does not include two checks dated uh, 29th and 31st. So here these two checks being sent through to them that does not include there which were received by the supplier after the statement has been prepared. OK, so here what we now have to do, we have to find out what amount is being included. So according to this, there are four amounts that were included in the two checks dated for these two. So what is the total amount if I'm going to look at it? So let's see here. If you look at the first one, 1968. Minus this 1623, it's going to give me 345. So here, if you take these two into consideration, that will balance this check here. This check now, it's associated with this opening balance and this credit note of 345. So that will probably settle this check. And the next one, it's for a value of 818 pounds. So how I'm going to find out which one is going to be equal to 818 pounds. See that here, it cannot be this, this, this. All right. So here, this one, it's not part of that 818 pounds. This is not definitely there. There's no other credit notes to go against it, but these two invoices. So look at that 326 pounds plus 492 pounds is going to be equal to 818 pounds. So these two are the missing link to these two uh, checks. They are asking you here, calculate the amount should have been paid to settle the remaining balances of the account. So what we have left now, we have one, two, three, four invoices left because these two checks are automatically balancing these two out there. So let's find out what is the rest of the invoices balancer. One, Eight uh, seven one plus one one five seven plus two four two seven plus nine hundred twenty six one. It's giving me a value of six three four one. You can do this calculation reversely as well. If you know this, this was the initial balance of that one, 8,782 
take away these two checks, 1623 and my 818. It gives me this missing amount of uh, whatever we found earlier, uh, 6361. So therefore, that is the amount we have to pay to settle the rest of the, the account there. So let's answer that one and now move on to task number seven. Task number seven is all about. Um, what is that again? Yeah, it is about processing transactions in your cash book. So here there are two receipts. Receipts means it's not money you receive. OK, possibly can be the receipts given by these companies like PWT colleges and choice catering as a token of receiving the cash or check for the goods or services they provided us. OK, so if you look at that here, first one is college, is college fees for three students enrolled on payroll courses. So you have paid for that one. The check was received for full amount. So we have paid PWT College to send, uh, you know, we, we to because we sent three of our um, um, uh, employees to study a payroll course there. So this is the amount they paid for it. And then obviously the catering services on a board meeting paid 195 pounds, including VAT paid to choice catering. This is also money paid out. So for you, in my books, how I'm going to record it, I will not use Petty Cash Book because it's no point I'm going to enter this big amounts in my Petty Cash Book. I will say it will be a payment in my cash book here. So on the general ledger code, the first one is going to be training because it's a training course there. And this one is going to be refreshments. And they're asking you to put the net amount. Since there is no VAT for it and it's exempt for VAT, we use the whole amount there. The system, the VAT code we use VAT exempt, VAT one there. And then next one is going to be 195 pounds divided by six multiplied by five is 160 pounds is the net amount before we could charge VAT, which is at 20%. So if you click down, VAT four will be the standard 20% VAT here. And then the rest of the amount, it's been all populated for you. OK, so next question is for you. At the end of the month, the debit side of the cash book total at 100 and, no, 113,726 pounds and 55 pence. The credit side is 15,299 pounds and 12 pence. So if you look at your cash book, this is simply not going to be the cash side. I'm thinking this is going to be your bank side. Obviously, this bank balance can be positive or negative as you can go overdrawn as well. Cash account on the other hand will cannot be overdrawn because it has to be either you have cash or no cash at all. You will not have a negative cash amount. So therefore the difference between those two accounts, let's calculate it 26.55 minus 15,299.12. That gives me an amount of an overdrawn balance, therefore we use a negative number, 1572.57. All right, now let's look at the next one. An organization keeps an analytical petty cash book and withdraws 200 pounds from bank on the first day of each month to top up the petty cash float. So what they're saying here, every month they put the same amount into my petty cash book to top it up. Doesn't matter how much is in there, we will just put 200 pounds there. So this is a non-impressed petty cash book. If it's an impressed one, what we'll do, we normally put back the same amount spent from the petty cash book. That means it changes every month. So if I have 200 pounds to start with, we spend 170 pounds there, we left with 30 pounds. Impress system means we put another 170 to bring it back to 200 and our work here way down. But here on the other hand, we're going to use 200 pounds. That means it's a non-impress because the balance will change every month. 
Okay. So here on September 1st, there are £12.88 in my petty cash box. Later on that day, a usual amount was withdrawn from the petty bank account to top up the petty cash float. During the month, petty cash purchases were totaled to £187.42. Identify the entry required in the petty cash book to record the closing balance. Okay, so here my closing balance has to be shown as opposite side of where you normally are opening balances isn't it because your closing balance has to be the the opposite side as always so here what we need to do we have to choose the right option it is be called your balance carried down because it's a closing balance and let's find out how much it should be okay so the amount we had started with 12 pound 88 plus the 200 we received from the bank minus the amount 187 pounds and 42 pence spent. So that gives me a new amount of 25 pounds and 46 pence in my petty cash book. But closing balance, on the other hand, it will go on the credit side of the petty cash book. Why? Because you will have always cash. Therefore, your balance board down will be on the debit side all the time. So balance carried down will be on the credit side there, guys. So be careful with this part. Petty cash book or cash book hash column will have balance carried down on the credit side, balance bought down on the debit side because you will always have cash or zero cash. You cannot have a negative cash. Let's look at this next one. Petty cash purchase in October is shown below. Voucher number 272. St stationary purchase from Office Express, £27.30 plus VAT. You have the receipt attached. What do you need to do? You have to enter in the books there. So we put the the net amount is £27.30. So 27.30 multiplied by 20% gives me a VAT amount of £5.46. And I'm going to multiply this by 120% or just by 6. That gives me £32.00. 76 we just add these together it will give me the same amount as well 32 pounds 76 there we have done our question number eight now let's move to question number nine so we have three more to go we still have 42 minutes plenty of time to work with but again guys very important remember i have said to students in the past there is no extra price for you you don't give bonus points for finishing early you have one hour 30 minutes use your one hour 30 minutes it's important you manage your time. I normally say I allocate six to seven minutes to one question, or if we extend some of the questions to 10 minutes, you may do five minutes on another question, but leave 10 minutes to go back and verify your answers. So you basically you have 80 minutes to go through 11 questions. You have 10 minutes to go and check everything to see everything's been filled out or not. All right. So be careful with your time management. Keep an efficient timekeeping to be on top of your work, OK? And uh, this is going to be, um, you know, one of those um, things going to set you apart from the other candidates because very important. You manage your time well, you will manage the course well. That is the bottom line, bottom line of it. So let's see this on task number nine. Uh, I have today uh, authorized a monthly standing order related to a motor insurance purchase from Pan Insurance. Please set up the recurring entry to pay a total of £1,512 in equal installment of 252 starting on 15th of October. The transaction is exempt from VAT. So this is an insurance and we're going to pay equal installment of £252. Therefore, we need to find out how many payments I need to make. So what I need to do, 1512 Divide by 252, that gives me there should be six payments. OK, and then also remember this one, it's been uh, asked to set up. Uh, let's see, monthly standing order. So there will be six monthly payments for the duration you have to use here. So here, bank payment here, the detail will be general insurance or motor insurance. This is a motor insurance. Start date is 15th of October. The frequency we're going to choose here, it's going to be monthly because if you know, notice I here, it's a monthly standing order. How many recurrences is going to be? So it will be six recurrences. It will be six payments you're going to make there. Therefore, it's six. The amount for £252 per month. And the VAT code in this scenario is going to be 
at exempted. Therefore, this one will not be uh, subject to any additional VAT on top of whatever the cost is there. Then again, this is how the Sage software will work when you're going to use Sage in the past. This will be how you enter that into that Sage screen. Now they're giving that in your ITBK unit, the introduction to bookkeeping. We simply have to learn. This is what you will do if they give you a computerized software. You just have to select what are you going to pay, how much you're going to pay, how often you're going to pay, and how many times you're going to pay, and then change the VAT to it. And then here, the following day, the digital bookkeeping system displays the message below. Do you want to process the recurring entries today? So if you look at that here, process one recurring entry by clicking onto the books alongside uh, with the appropriate amount. So here we have to. Uh, a process, uh, one of those recurring entries. So if you notice that so far. Process one recurring entry by clicking on the box alongside with the appropriate amount. So which one I have to process? If I were right, when are we now? Because we at the moment today is. Doesn't say when it is. Uh, yeah, if you look at that here, 252 pounds, I'm assuming is the right one, but let's check it anyway quickly. Wait a minute. What's the date it says? Ah, OK. We have to think about it on the time scale. If you notice that here now. A new bank payment was authorized as shown below on the note. This was given to you on 1st of October. So we set this up on 1st of October, but the payment is not due until 15th of October. So now the following day is going to be the 2nd of October. So they're asking you here, the following day, the digital bookkeeping system displays the message below. Do you want to process recurring entries today? What is the recurring entry out of these here is due on 2nd of October, only this. This is on 6th of October. This is on 15th of October. This is on 29th of October. We don't have to process it until we get to that day. Since the current date is 2nd of October, we only process this one and then we will confirm it. We are processing that payment. OK, so let's answer this one. Move on to question number 10. So here this task is about transferring from books of prime entry. This task contains part A to C. Uh, so we have two information there. A sales return day book entry for Jutla designs for the total of 35, 35, 20 or 33,535 pounds and 20 pence. And then you have back to net here. And you may ask me which books they will be going to. So think from this perspective, one of them, it's going to be always thought about. The totals will go into anything to do with sales, sales return, discount allowed will go into one control account and the net is always the name of the day book. That's how I normally do it. OK, so I have to remember which one is what. So the total is going to be always the receivable control account. So we put that amount here, 35, 35.20. The VAT is going to be 589.20. And the sales return will be 2946, which is the net amount. But now we have to decide whether it's going to be debit or credit. What is the rules of accounting? You need to have equal amount of debits equal to equal amount of credits, and they should both match. OK, so when now there's a transaction, there will be a debit and a credit or one debit or multiple credits or one credit, multiple debits. It depends on what is the, the scenario we're talking about. But in this one, we have to decide which one is a debit or credit. So think from the sales uh, or the, the RLCA, which is the receivable control account, RLCA which normally include debit balances from the amount the customer owe you. That comes from your sales day book. But when you return some of the goods, uh, they return the goods back to you, you have to issue them a credit note. What happens to their balances? Is it going to increase or decrease it? It will decrease their balances, of course. 
the the credit notes in fact reduces the asset for me. The customer will pay you less. Therefore, this has to be a credit entry into my RLCA because normally this is the debit balance. And same, if this is a credit, these two should be debit. But let's prove it. So when you make a sales, the sales will go into credit side of my sales account because it's in your income. But when you return the goods back to you, the goods are coming back to you means you're losing that income. You have to do an entry into the debit side for the sales return account. It is sort of an expense for you because you're no longer going to enjoy that income you generated by doing some sales earlier. So therefore, this is classified as an expense. And that will be a debit into their T account. So again, look at this. These, these two debits and it will be equal to this credit there. Six marks for that. So it's very important you understand which way you have to uh, do these answers because you may get this right. If you get all of that wrong, you get three marks here. So you just have to be a bit careful with it. And the last bit here, the discount received day books has been total and the old amount, all the amounts been transferred to the general accounts. One of the transactions a, uh, relates to a credit note of 62 pounds plus VAT received from Pell Limited because we have taken advantage of a from payment discount because that's how you may receive a discount um, entry into the discount received uh, cash uh, the day book. So they are asking you here, identify the ledger in which this credit note will be entered. So here we have to think about it. OK, what well, I'm going to be entering this credit note. They're saying here it is already been entered. OK, one of those transactions relates to a credit note. So it is already been entered means on my general ledger. I no longer have to worry about this in the general ledger. I have to look at only my subsidiaries. Therefore, this is going to be a payable accounts because this was received from Pell Limited. Pell Limited will be in my payables because we owe them the money and they are asking you here how I'm going to enter it. We're going to choose the name of the company, which is Pell Limited. It cannot be Jutla Limited. The reason we are Jutla, we can't have our own account in my purchases ledger. It can be only my supplier's name and the amount is going to be the total plus. That means net plus VAT, which is 62 multiplied by 1.2. It's going to be 74 pounds. And 40 pence, but will that be a debit or credit? That's the question. Again, we're going to ask ourselves normally when we owe amount to my supplier that will be the credit side of my payables ledger because it's a liability i owe to that supplier when i receive a credit note from them what it happens to that balance that balance get reduced the only way you can reduce that balance is by putting that on the um, the debit side of that one the debit side will reduce my liability which is already on the credit side so the entry will be on the debit side of it so let's answer that one and now let's move on to Task number 11. I started with a very hot coffee. Now I'm enjoying a little bit of a iced coffee now. Um, yeah, task number 11. It's related to. There are two balances here about an account. They're asking you the supplier account below is ready to be total and balance at the end of October. So now what we need to do for Sharif supplies, I need to enter what are the amount has to be going in here to find the end required record, the closing balance. So the closing balance has to be identified as what is my the highest balance of both sides. The highest balance, if I look at it, it's going to be. 1492 plus 1492. One eight, uh, sorry, 4692 plus 1831. It's going to give me 6,523 pounds. That will be my credit side. And the debit side is going to be 144. So we have to put the total as 6,523. Take away this 144 pounds. That gives me a balance carried down figure of 6,379. So here, 6,379, and this has to go on the debit side because this will lead you to match that total. And then here, the option we have to choose is my balance 
have it down. They are asking here, calculate the total amount that would be entered on each debit and credit columns after the closing balance has been recorded. So if I recorded 6,523, I've done my balance carry down here. This also will have 6,523. So that is the amount we simply have to put it down here because both totals will show 6,523. Total, please remember, it's not the balance. Total is just the amount we use so we can match the account balances okay so let's move down to the next column last bit of a question there the following two accounts are in the le general ledger at the close of day 31st of october so what we now have to do we have to identify what is the opening balance of these accounts on 1st of november so if i closing balance goes on this side we expect the opening balances will be the same side where the balance is higher because if you create a closing balance, you may, you must open an opening balance on the opposite side of that, where the balance are normally going to be higher for the first of that next period. Because the closing balance is going to be the end of the month. Notice that here, 31st of October, and the opening balances will be on the 1st of November after that. So let's look at that first account, GL020. We have two balances there, £559 plus 1928 minus 39 that gives me 2448 pound 2448 the opening balance is going to be shown balance board down but here it is a debit why this is where the most amount is so when you close this account balance board down balance carry down will be on the credit side balance board down will be on the debit side here on the second account though because it's a credit account the accounts on the credit side so therefore we're going to add that and take away the difference it's going to give me balance board down figure of 560 and this uh, have an opening balance of 560 on the credit side because this is where the most amount is so i answered all of that one and I haven't submitted that question. It asks you to submit it because I haven't submitted it. Why? Because I may be able to whiz through these questions like this to see I have to amend any of it. So like here, I have marked any questions. I highlighted anything. I can go back and check it. Oh, yeah, I have highlighted this. I need to find out whether I have to clear anything here because at the moment it looks like i haven't missed anything out i haven't had an example to show you but if in that case if i say click edit on this one i can go oh yeah i got this wrong let's change it here i can change it before i submit that one see that one now opens up to answer you can't move to the next question you have to wait until you click on answer and then you get to a point you have everything checked up now so once you completed that one you can always go here and submit assessment. It says here, end your assessment confirmation, uh, and then do you wish to submit your assessment? You will not be able to go back to check your responses. Let's submit it and see how we performed. So let's click on submit. On the same screen now, we're waiting for that response. It's been saved. You may potentially get a breakdown. Like here, it gives you a, a result straight away. So it gives me, Everything's correct apart from one. I made a small mistake somewhere on processing um, task number seven. OK, so I may have to go back and check it. it. Might be one mark there, but let me check it whether which one I have probably made a mistake there. Answer seven. Maybe a decimal. I have put one decimal wrong there. Maybe I haven't done anything. Incorrectly, yeah. Out of eight, I have got seven marks. Maybe I had I didn't even choose the the model option because I remember I filled out all the boxes. May ha I may have not uh, filled in one of the boxes correctly. So therefore, it shows me all the information you know you needed from the answers there, and um, it is really good practice module before you go and do the actual exam. I'm not sure in the exam you will get one like this way because. This is just a practice assessment. The real assessment might be slightly different, guys. So uh, we just expect you to give it a go, see how we're looking. And then I'm hoping to do the ITBK practice assessment too uh, in short while, possibly uh, by 
uh, end of this week, and then I'm uh, planning to upload that as well. Hopefully, fingers crossed, um, you know, you'll have more coming up in due time. By Christmas, I would have done a uh, couple of from uh, the bookkeeping control and then obviously some level three uh, assessments as well, which I will uh, try to do the first uh, level three assessment called uh, FATS means financial statements preparation for the sole traders and partnerships. We're going to be looking into that uh, for level three uh, candidates. So for now then, guys, I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you for tuning into it. And of course, if you like this video, please click on the subscribe button and um, you know leave a comment if you need any further advice or even uh, to say what you would like me to do uh, next. OK, so if you have further, um, you know, like uh, interest in accounting, of course, please follow up and look at my previous videos and then obviously uh, do leave your comments and likes. Uh, it just um, it'll help me to grow the. The. Um, uh, what do you call scope and uh, reach more um, potential students and uh, help them achieve their dream of completing your AAT successfully. Um, I know it's very challenging uh, proportions when it comes to a new um, uh, qualification. Is it is um, uh, what we call again a challenge, but we have to accept the challenge to move forward and succeed in our pursuit of uh, greatness. So guys, nothing else to go on here and I'm looking forward to see you again soon and uh, wish you all the best. And uh, uh, let me just say, yeah, take care guys and uh, all the best. Bye bye.